them. Oh, can we get group chat here? Okay. I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, at least our son is there to take care of her if it's bad. He needs to. Seems like it can't be that bad. But. Okay. Something else. <laughs> I left you in the other room. Yeah, yeah. Nah, don't work there. So I basically updated the uh, charter slides from last time. They say almost the same thing. Yeah, uh, I just tweaked it a little bit. Okay. Um, so, but it lists you as giving that part. 
So we got the agenda, then we got my group keying thing, okay. and then there's the charter thing which has your name on it, and then there's the remote presentation. From the okay, I have to. They changed it one more time, so I should do the charter thing if that's okay. Sure, no. we can we can vary from the order of the agenda. Uh, they put well, actually, I want to see the rekeying, so we'll do that. Um, I just have to go sit where they tell me how IDR is not doing a good job. So, so I've plugged this in here. I didn't notice it. But why is that? The projector is making light. This is a perfectly good adapter that I was using last week. Okay. And nothing's working. Why is that? Do, 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 is there anything? It usually just plugs in and goes right it for yours. It auto detects things, absolutely. Yeah, so it should I go thought. zap and change to a lower resolution and do the whole thing. Let's check the, let's check the cable. Sure. Oh, I have no idea. Do you want to try mine and see if it does it? Sure. Let's uh, do you want to use my adapter? Or do you have one? Do you want no, I don't need your one? adapter. Uh, uh, I, I have a, an adapter which works great last week and uh, when I, they want me to try you know, the HDMI also. Um, okay. Uh, you want to uh, try the HDMI? Sure. Yeah. Let's try this one. Um, HDMI is over here. And then also yeah. power it with the USB. Oh, okay. Yeah. So There's USB. Nope. HDMI is here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's HDMI. Sorry. Yeah, the and then USB, USB goes. Okay. Let's give it a try. Sure. I mean, I do this all the time. <laughs> it's like they didn't make it. There's a gap between here and the projector. Yeah, but actually, it was working with the session that was here before the yours. Yes. I uh, no doubt. <laughs> actually, I was here. I saw that work. So. And the VGA, you already tried it. Uh, I'll try it again. And I can screw this in a bit just in case there's a little bit of a mechanical thing, although I don't normally have a problem. So uh, it, it's like completely ignoring it. We have technical problems, so there may be a slight delay. <laughs> I thought the other video died. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me try and see if it works. Mine. Sure. Okay, give me a second. I'm going to go and get all the. Because you're so efficient, no slides were done on mine, but I should be able to download. Okay, the, all the current slides are uploaded, no, 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 and yeah, so. Just give me 10 seconds yeah. to. I do. I search for Phil and find the string. But. Yeah, I had it here in the. Oh, okay. okay. Archive, download, reading. Oh, I see. Is that going to. No, it's giving me the group of yeah, why don't you just go to materials and download them separately? There's only four things. It's not, um, not too huge. Go to the material. Yeah, just, okay. There you go. Uh, that's a lot of data. If you go to the data tracker materials, then you'll come okay. there. Okay, let me go from there. Go get it. Should be able to just do this, right? Yep. There we go. There's the fourth thing. Yep. There we go. All the uploaded ones, things are PDFs. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm impressed that you did so much better at uh, last year when you were on Nogco. I'm not quite as. I guess. Yeah. I have my interview this afternoon.
you don't want the you want things on the left. Right. Just those four things. This is four things. Sure. Okay. Yeah. One was a um, one was a uh, one was a PowerPoint. Oh really? Okay. Well, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. You should have PowerPoint. It should be fine. Okay. Ah, okay. uh, we have John Hudson. Let's see if blue. I have it. May I? Yes. Thank you. Do whatever you want. Oh, I, 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 uh, I was because uh, of the problems. I thought it might be mechanical. So oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. No, no. I almost never do this, some of these things. Yeah, but I decided to try it in case it was case something was weird it. to do with that. Oh, don't worry about it. Okay. Look. Fantastic. Yeah. Technical okay. problems have been at least partially overcome. Okay. So now all I have to do is get the double. You think I want a chance to double screen? No, we just want to go. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you think will work. I, well, I can't see it here. So um, let's see what this does. Oh, look. Second duplicate. That's the one. Now I can see it. Okay. Uh, we start with the agenda and status. Right. Okay, and I should be able to get this. this so, um, well, how oh, it? I assume this is an uh, auto slide advancer. Yes, it's but a slide. It has a second piece, right? Uh, someone walked off with the second. Apparently. No, there it is, over there, behind the. Oh, behind. Okay. Okay, I'll there plug it go. in, and if I sure. have to go to. Um, well, that's right. <clears throat> this has a problem. There we go. Hopefully, so shall we see if the slide advance works? Sure. Okay. Yes, it works. Okay. Do you want to do that? Or? Um, sure. Okay. Hi there. This is the Troll Working Group. <laughs> We're going to get underway. Um, so, uh, I'm Donald Lee Slate from Huawei, and Sue Harris is Hickory Hill. It's holding it to my left. I'm the secretary. John Hudson, the other co-chair with Sue, is not here uh, this meeting. We're using the other machine. So, um, and Leah is our AD, but I guess she trusts us because she's not here. <laughs> That's okay. So note well. I assume you've seen this before. Uh, anything you present or basically input into the working group process is subject to IPR disclosure rules and so forth. Study that. Um, the uh, Quality of the documents we produce, which is really the output of the IETF, depends on review. So if you want people to review your document, you should review other people's documents, and then everybody's documents will be better, most likely. This is our agenda. Um, I'm going to present on a little bit on group keying, and then uh, Sue's going to present on the chart revision, and we have a remote presentation on parent node shifts and tree construction mitigation. Um, so I guess I'll just go ahead and give news on what's happened since our last meeting. We've had four RFCs published, uh, which are listed here, distributed layer three gateway, uh, a RFC on the uh, interface addresses app sub TLV, which is a data format for use in the directory stuff, uh, use of data labels for tree selection and a arbitrary channel header extension. Arbitrary channels are control messages between trill switches and uh, this header extension provides for various payload types and also adds security. A good thing. A couple drafts have passed working group last call and centralized replication and uh, resilient trees. Uh, there are now three drafts in last call. ARP optimization, which was sent back from the IESG and has been substantially modified and uh, is now in working group last call again uh, with the modified version. Uh, smart end nodes is um, I, I posted a review and I think it needs to be modified to take that into account and then trill over IP is finally in working group last call and we've adopted the ECN support draft so and here's just a couple slides in this slide deck uh, showing all the RFCs we have previously uh, had uh, issued by the ITF and status of some other drafts so that's kind of that for the status. So I guess I should go ahead with my presentation on group keying.
Okay. Uh, One of the things that we're, we're uh, looking at next is some of the data uh, center stuff for Trill as it's being deployed. Let me start with Donald's key. Okay, so. Uh, Thank you, sir. Here's your sure. Hopefully it'll work. Next slide, please. So I'm Donald Lisa with Huawei. So um, Trill has some communications protocols that it standardizes. And in particular, there's the, uh, uh, well, I'll get to them in a little bit, enumerate them in a second. But the, for these communications protocols, you don't really know in general whether the Trill switches are locally in a controlled environment or maybe they're far apart and you have insecure communication. So you, you really want to have some way of securing that. and. Um, there's sort of two aspects to securing. One is like the formats of the packets and the encryption algorithms and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing is keying, because it doesn't really matter how good the other stuff is if you can't get good secure secret keys to the endpoints or sorry, uh, to use by, for those algorithms, then you still don't have security. And modern uh, criterion, which is uh, I was going to say enforced, but more like strongly encouraged by the IETF security area requires a key negotiation so that you uh, don't keep using the same key. You don't just have manual configuration. You, you can have manual configuration as an option, but you really want a way where you automatically generate new session keys and so forth. So you really want to have uh, a reasonable way to do that sort of thing. Um, next slide. Uh, so uh, two particular areas uh, where Trill has uh, some Keying is arbitrary channel messages, which I mentioned briefly earlier, which are typed control messages between Trill switches. And we're also just getting the Trill over IP through. So Trill supports IP encapsulation of the traffic between Trill switches, uh, both the Trill control traffic and the data traffic. Uh, and there are other kinds of uh, links besides IP that Trill supports. Of course, you've got Ethernet, but Ethernet already has its own kind of security stuff. So we're really mostly worried about the communications channels that Trill has specified. So uh, unicast is pretty easy. So you just have to get the session key to the endpoints. And typically, people have already figured out how to do that, kind of. So the existing RFC on Arbit channels, the um, extension 7978 adding security, just says it's used DTLS. DTLS has all kinds of really modern key negotiation. It's great. And similarly, IP draft says use Ike v2. It has all the modern stuff. But this is really just point to point. Next slide. So uh, multicast or broadcast kind of things can be more efficient because it decreases link utilization and decreases port utilization um, as advantages. But it's trickier for security. So uh, arbitrary channel uh, facility is the way it's designed automatically supports uh, multicast or basically with to all the Trill switches that have advertised uh, interest in a particular VLAN or fine-grained label. So it already has that built into it. IP, of course, has multicast defined. It's not always supported, but there are certainly especially local networks which support native IP multicast. So in those cases, you'd like to be able to use those facilities and you'd like to be able to use them securely. Next slide. Uh, so. There's like different ways you can try to do multicast security. Well, first is not really multicast security. It's just you send multiple copies to everybody. It's serial unicast. Two is where you distribute a secret key to all the members of the group, and they can use that to encrypt uh, multicast or broadcast. And that can be secure, but the more people that know the key, you know, this slightly less secure, and um, you no longer have any way of telling. Uh, cryptographically is securing which of the group members originated a message. Since they're all using the same key in the group, you can tell it came from somebody in the group, but you can't tell which. So the question then is for two, whether the added uh, efficiency of multicast is worth the small reduction in security. Whether that's a small reduction, I guess, depends on your security requirement. Next slide. It's also possible to use other kinds of security, like public key security, where everybody has a different key, and you use public key and everything. The problem with that is it's more, it's uh, computationally less efficient. And I mean, like many orders of magnitude, kind of, it could be ten thousand times as, as uh, inefficient. So it may not be practical. And there are other kind of more complicated, exotic ways of doing things, which are not really too bright, widely deployed. Um, some of them are standardized, but it's not too widely deployed. Next slide. 
So, so the idea is for Trill, which uh, you can obviously do, if you have point-to-point -point security, you can obviously do the serial unicast, is to extend it to type two. So if you have a network where the slight reduction in security, where you can't tell who originated a message is, is a problem, then you can always fall back to serial unicast, which will be uh, secure. Uh, so next slide. So the, uh, the draft uh, East Lake Trill group keying specifies a way to do uh, to securely distribute a key from uh, one group member to the other group member so they all have the same key, you can use it. Uh, and there'd be ideas, there'd be a companion draft that would define uh, the details of how to use that for Trill over IP and the details of how to use that for Arbor channels. And it's uh, the, the facility, the group keying facility is designed so you could tailor it for other things too. Um, uh, so it's, it's sort of a generic way to do things. Next slide. Uh, so it uses, it assumes you already have pairwise keying set up. If you're going to be doing broadcasts or multicasts, you almost always have unicast traffic between at least some pairs anyway. So if you set up point-to-point uh, -point security, you now have a secure way to communicate and you can use that uh, for distributing the key. So in fact, the group key is effectively serially unicast to the members of the group. This is actually very similar to the way Wi-Fi or 802.11 does security. It has a group key for Wi-Fi multicast and things like that, and the uh, access point serially unicast it to the stations. So it's very similar. Um, and it says it assumes there'll be some details set up for each particular use, in particular how to tell which is the designated group member to originate the key and what kind of uh, enveloping you need. Uh, obviously, to send something over IP is a little different from sending it over an arbitrary channel. So it needs slightly different headers and trailers. Next slide. Um, and it has key identifiers. So you can have multiple keys outstanding. You can distribute a new key and then send out a command to tell everybody to roll over to that new key, so forth. Um, so I already have covered the last note there. Next slide. I don't want to take too much time because we started a bit late. So this is kind of a, just very generally what these messages in this group keying look like. Uh, they have an inner uh, container, so to speak, which uses the AES key wrap. I probably should have put the RFC here. The AES key wrap is uh, there's an RFC which specifies it. It's actually really specified by uh, NIST in the US government, but it's a way of a multiple encryption using AES. Um, and then, uh, you put as much as you can in there because that's the sort of the strongest protection. And then you have an outer container and you put a minimal amount in the outer part so you can recognize what this message is about and what's going on. And uh, that's secured using this point-to-point -point security you already have set up. Okay, this leverages existing point-to-point -point security. So that's sort of this orange container on the outside. And all the details, of course, are in the draft, which is uh, draft name is in this presentation. Next slide. So this is just a five-member group. So you have one designated node elected or determined in some way, and it basically sends keys, uh, generates a key, and sends it to everybody. And then all these five, each, each of them could originate a message either to all the members of the group or some multicast subset or whatever. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Sorry if I rushed a bit, but I want to hopefully have to explain. Yeah? Oops. Uh, e Jolie. So is this group keying uh, protocol hooked to the like uh, the member membership update? For example, there's a new member joining to the group and leaving or kind of Yeah, there's there's material in there. If a new member joins the group, that's generally not a problem uh, because as soon as they have secure communication to the uh, designated node, then the designated node can give them the current key and maybe any future keys that it wants, and then that new member of the group can start receiving and transmitting fine when a member of the group leaves in general what you should do is rekey the remaining members because this yeah. this person is no longer a member of the group and you know the draft since it's kind of intended to be a general draft it says that you should do that but sometimes if you have a highly dynamic group with members entering and leaving yeah, all the yeah. time it may be impractical to rekey that often so you really have to make a judgment depending on the application I see. Um, and so certainly anybody who wants to review the drafts <laughs> uh, and comment will be welcome to do so. And, and actually for this draft, if you get a chance, guys, 
it would be useful to take a look at it. I'll try to take a look at it this next week, Donald, and go through it. Rekeying is important because when they're in the middle of the data center stuff or when you're in the middle of deployments, having the group key uh, secure and Donald's process is pretty effective. So because a lot of data center traffic or a lot of land traffic can get attacked and this will, will provide quick rekeying. Yeah. Um, it probably would have been a good idea for me to present to presented this to SAG at this meeting. I could maybe do that next meeting if depending on Isn't the SAG on Friday? Uh, it's normally Thursday afternoon. Okay. So it would be good. Me, I mean I guess see if they have any time. Um and uh you know, I just wanted to point out but I can't don't remember what it was. So, okay. Okay. Did I if so I'm gonna go through the charter changes. Um our focus has been from the AD to try to get things that um, make Trill deployed. What's missing? So remember, that's what happened. So we've done current charter, and uh, thanks to Donald and, and John and all of you, we're making really good um, progress on it. I'm, the thing I'm always impressed with this working group is we click through things fairly quickly, and people respond in the mail with, with good reviews. So... We're sort of down to the ARP uh, reduction draft, which we've gone through twice, and the directory mechanisms are about there. So we're in a lot of review process, and we're doing the uh, Trill pseudo wires, and we've gone to the um, multi level and multi topology. So a lot of our initial work is done, but standardization for interoperability is getting the reviews all the way through. Now the intercampus control plane uh, stuff is pending and we've been doing the security analysis. Uh, interoperability has been requested by ADs to move to web, so we'll try to keep getting stuff. So the question that we're sort of looking is we've been adding ECN support um, and uh, transparent mode to provide better input inside of the data centers. It'd be good to see if this really matters to deployments you're working with. And so we'd like some feedback because we will uh, do a final call here within a couple of weeks for the charter change. And then uh, what we've got as uh, to be specific is we've added the ECN will supply, uh, supply um, extensions for more transparent connections uh, and we'll specify to have more transparent mode Excuse me. <coughs> the um, and then we'll specify uh, to support other payloads such as IP. So please look at it, um, and we'll change the name. Please look at it. We'll post this uh, new charter in a couple of weeks. We're trying to get through all of our other reviews so we can just clear our uh, docket. Some of it's stuck with the AD, uh, but she sort of overloaded for a little bit while she was ill. So I think that's it. <coughs> Do you want to? Will it be presented remotely? Yes. And it'll leave the I've got here. Now, um, guys, I'm going to have to ask for your uh, indulgence. This is the first time I've had two working groups where I have to appear at the same time as a chair. So I will go out for about five or ten minutes and leave Donald with it. Donald has graciously agreed to take care of the remote presentation. Do we have our remote presenter on? Uh, yes, he's online. Uh, our uh, Ramesh Warren. So let's see, I should be able to. Uh, uh, oh, one other question. Uh, do we have a Jabber Stribe here, actually? We should have done that earlier. Uh, oh, we didn't get a yeah. I'll do minutes. Right, we can do minutes easily enough from the audio. But is there anybody in the Jabber room for Trill? Uh, it would be useful to have somebody there to monitor things. Well, actually, I can do that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, um, one moment here. I did this, triggered this yesterday. 
Uh, well, what is this ping? Um, okay, so I guess what I want to do here is, uh, uh oh, uh, uh, I push this button. Does that actually do anything? Spin some meat echo. Um, so, uh, I believe we want to get uh, Meet Echo to have uh, the remote presenter being displayed. I don't know if he needs to do anything to, to do that. Um, So it's here. Well, anyway, um, maybe I should figure that out. Won't type on. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. And let me know if you can. Yeah, Sh shall I start or? As the sound doesn't seem to be too bad. Um, we can't actually see you. I'm not sure if you're trying to do video, but. Yeah, uh, now you should, you should be able to. Okay. okay. Ah, there you are. Excellent. Okay, so I guess I can get started. Um, basically, this this draft deals with you know the default trill tree construction rules can create situations where a, for a particular node the parent node might shift in certain situations. So it tries to offer two solutions for that, and uh, basically uh, we can go through those. Uh, my name is Ram Kumar, and I work for Brocade Communications. Uh, next slide, please. You have it. Right. So, so uh, the the subsequent slides will basically uh, give you a picture which explains what the problem is. But basic uh, the tr trills tree construction rules can create situations where you know the parent node for a particular child node will shift during tree construction, even if there is no apparent change in the pa the the links or the availability of the parent. So this draft has, uh, it proposes two different solutions to address that. And uh, we can go through the logic of each of those. And uh, so the motivation for this was that, you know, I, I was aware of situations where people, where customers were impacted by this and were looking for ways to solve it. So to that extent, I mean, basically, if, if this is uh, important enough, then uh, this, uh, we can request adoption of this uh, draft. Next slide, please. So, uh, actually, you could skip to the next slide. That's fine. Well, yeah. 
so so the, so the problem basically comes down to this this paragraph and this uh, uh, text in the draft in the uh, draft and with the correction in seven seven eight zero. So if you have it uh, a, a node when you're pulling the node into the SPF tree, if the node has let's say p parents and you're constructing tree number j, then the the rule basically mandates that your parent selection will be j minus one mod p. This will be the index of the parent, where the parents are uh, arranged in ascending order of seven byte ISIS octet ID. So, uh, next slide, please. So, this one, this slide explains that uh, situation. Um, so, if you see, look at the spine leaf low, uh, network on the top right of the slide. Uh, consider tree two and assume that uh, node A is the uh, is the root of the tree. So, at the ini at the outset, basically when A starts pulling in nodes into the network, it will immediately pull in one, two, and three. So one, two, and three do not have a choice of parent; they will be pulled in by A. But when it comes to B and C, they can be. So I think the links on the slide are not very sh showing um, in the right color, I guess. But they, all the nodes are connected to each other, and it's a, it's 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 basically a spine leaf network in the traditional uh, topo topology. So, but when it comes to B and C, you have a choice. Basically, they can be pulled into the SPF tree from node one, from node two, or from node three. And for the purpose of this discussion, assume that all the links have the same cost. So, the, you know, B, for example, will be reachable at a cumulative hop count of two. C will also be reachable at a hop count of two, regardless of which parent uh, it is selected, whether it's one, two, or three. Next slide, please. So, the, so that is fine. You could initially start off with the trill rule, and um, the calculation on the previous slide explained how uh, two, node two was selected as the parent, and that's basically because if you if you if you look at one, two, and three, order them in. Uh, assume they are already in sorted ascending order of seven byte octet id the index that will be used for tree 2 for b and c they have three possible parents and this is tree 2 so 2 minus 1 mod 3 is is 1 mod 3 is 1 so the index of the selected parent will be 2 now and that's why 2 was the parent for b and c in the previous slide uh, i hope that was clear from the links now con now consider what happens if node 1 goes down so when node 1 goes down um, the parent, the picture of the parent selection changes. So now B and C don't have three possible parents. They have two possible parents, which are node two and node three. They are in ascending order. They are arranged as node two comma node three, node two at index zero and node three at index one. Now you now you run your trills parent selection rule, which says three minus one mod number of parents. So that is two minus one mod two in this case. So that's one mod two. That's one, but now the node at index one is no longer node two; it's node three. So B and C's parents shift from node two to node three. This is uh, this is unnecessary because node two never went away. It's it's healthy. Its links to B and C are healthy, so there is no need, no reason for B and C to change its parent. So th so the uh, and this can cause some amount of disruption in the network depending on you know how you have striped your VLANs. Not only from the you know just not only just from the links themselves changing, there can be other other ways in which it can, more disruption is possible. So next slide, please. So the first approach that the draft takes, it gives two different solutions. The first solution is that you can use affinity sub TLB to solve this. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in a sim stated simply, basically the node that wants to ma maintain the parent bindings sends out an affinity sub TLB naming the children. Uh, that it wants to hold on to across the network change events. Be, um, so if you go back to the previous slide, the node, uh, actually you can go to the next slide, that's fine. If you go, um, no, actually go, uh, skip to the diagram, the following slide. Yeah. So in this case, what happens is in the same situation, before node one goes down, node two sends out an affinity sub TLV uh, to all the nodes in the network as part of its router capability or the multi-topology uh, router capability TLVs. And everybody knows that two wants to bind to B and C. 
So the way this is framed in the draft is that you, you must have a CLI option on node 2 stating that the operator wants this node to be sticky for its children. So the way I, at least I envisioned it in the draft is that you have a loose, loosely stated stickiness in the sense that you don't say node 2 has to have these children as its sticky children. You just say that node 2 is sticky. So and as so node 2 initially starts off by publishing the affinity TLV and I mean I think the draft talks about the first tree construction using default trill rules and then subsequent ones using the affinity TLV, but you don't, you could directly start with the affinity TLV too. So, but with the loose binding, the, the way it works is that node 2 doesn't like try to hold on to BNC under all possible cases. It just, it disregards the trill rule. It also disregards the affinity TLV and tries to see whether it, it can potentially retain the children that it had in prior iterations as as part of natural tree formation so links may come up links may go down nodes may come up nodes may go down the situation in the topology can change but if two remains in contention for the same set of children it tries to hold on to them by say, continuing to send out the affinity tlv if if it reaches a situation where it cannot send it it can no longer be the parent for those children or if the parent child relationship inverts because some links went down and b and c are now pulling two into the tree as a child then in that case it will retract it so, so the, the node that is sticky publishes the affinity TLV, the other nodes blindly honor it. And if there is any, uh, if, if it is not possible to honor the parent child relationship, two retracts the TLV. Next slide, please. So, the second approach deals with this very differently. I mean, it uses a modified version of the SPF algorithm where you are. Uh, if you can pull out multiple, when you're pulling nodes in from into the network, into the SPF tree, if you can pull multiple nodes, uh, if a node can be pulled by multiple parents at the same cost, then it uh, it allows you to insert a policy filter, which allows you to choose the node. So now that's one part of it. The second part of it is that what, how, how does this help with the previous problem? Well, you make the policy filter choose the Pre, the parent that you had in the previous iteration of the tree. So in this case, you, you everybody starts off with Trill's default tree computation with, with the with the Trill default rules that were that I stated previously. And as you move into successive, as the tree gets recalculated due to network events, you try to latch your policy filter to the previous choice of parent that you had for the for the same child nodes. So in this case, uh, next slide, please. Actually, we can go to the picture. Uh, the, So if you if you take the same situation uh, with this approach too, so the initial tree construction happens with initial tree construction happens with full default node uh, rules. Then later in subsequent tree calculations, when node goes down, everybody has access to what the tree looked like when node one was up. Now they use that and feed that into their policy filter. And now with the modified SPF algorithm, when they construct the new tree the B, uh, B and C will automatically get pulled in through two because they were in the previous snapshot because in the previous snapshot they were pulled in through two. So can you go back one slide, please? So, but the, the challenge with this approach is that you're, you're using something like a time latch and basically th this is happening in a di distributive fashion across all the, uh, uh, all the nodes in the network. So everybody has to agree on what the previous snapshot looked like for them to for this approach to work successfully. So in general, that's a little bit hard to do. But what 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 you could potentially do is leverage the fact that by the time you download your routes to hardware, every node in the network has to agree on what the tree looks like. So by by putting it near that hardware download trigger and by dampening it sufficiently, you should be able to make this work. But even then, probably it will work best in like small or medium-sized networks. Uh, so, uh, can we skip to the slide after the next one? So, between the two approaches, I think approach A is more preferable because it's much more predictable. Affinity sub TLV is well understood, and you know, I mean, it's it's known to work. Um, the only consideration being that if, if somebody else has a patent on approach A, then we need to think about it. 
the neither of these approaches has any uh, has any IPR advocate. So that's about all I had. Uh, any questions? Hi. Uh, so uh, I think this is a important problem. Um, the I guess the only question I have really uh, I think I understand the uh, least approach A. Uh, approach B seems a little uh, depends on what kind of policies you'd want to set up and things. But um, there is another draft actually, which is called Resilient Trees, which is aimed at a slightly different problem, uh, not so much the stability, but rather uh, rapid uh, establishment of a tree after a failure. And um, it's actually fairly long. So I guess the only question I have would be uh, whether it can somehow uh, also be used to help with the problem that you're talking about. But uh, uh, so you might be useful to look at that draft. So uh, uh, it's draft okay. ITF trill resilient trees, but. OK, uh, I, I think I've gone through it. But you Sorry. Um, I believe they use a different tree algorithm altogether. Um, and you come out with two trees, correct? This, this is oriented more towards the uh, implementation which use the traditional SPF, the Dijkstra algorithm. Yes. Uh, so, so um, well, I, at least it would be, be, be good to be sure that, uh, let's just say we adopt approach A for solution of the uh, problem that you are talking about be good to make sure there was no conflict between that and the uh, thing in resilient trees or if there were then you'd need to comment to say something about that how to okay. uh, maybe you can only use one of them okay I i'll take a look at it and uh, <laughs> yeah probably get back on the list or something sure that'd be a good thing to discuss on the mailing list okay There, uh, so I guess I'm also chairing here. Does anybody else have a comment uh, on the uh, presentation? Okay, I'll thank you for the presentation. And uh, I guess I can push the red button here. <laughs> Let's see. Um, let's see, we have, uh, I'm not sure how to get back to the agenda, but the agenda really only had, uh, like one more slide, uh, Well, uh, let's build. Here we go. Well, I'm also not used to this. So we did want to just, I'm just going to very briefly go over the milestone situation. Uh, we have achieved more milestones that are coming along, but we have an increased number that are um, overdue. Uh, so there's some idea that perhaps we should update the milestones at the same time as the charter. Uh, admittedly, the milestones aren't considered that uh, weighty or binding a thing, most of the ITF working groups, but uh, it would be good to get these uh, milestones set to something that's uh, plausible. Um, let's see. So that's really the last uh, item we have for presentation. Uh, is there any other topic or anything people want to bring up at this meeting? Um, if not, uh, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, I guess the next meeting is in Chicago. So uh, see you on the list and uh, at the Chicago meeting.
Yeah, it's uh. Okay. Thank you.